Section two of the Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. Translated from the German by Constance Garnett. Chapter one Introduction. Section 1. The Essential Nature of Man Religion has its basis in the essential difference between man and the brute. The brutes have no religion. It is true that the old, uncritical writers on natural history attributed to the elephant, among other laudable qualities, the virtue of religiousness. But the religion of elephants belongs to the realm of fable. Cuvier, one of the greatest authorities on the animal kingdom, assigns, on the strength of his personal observations, no higher grade of intelligence to the elephant than to the dog. But what is this essential difference between man and the brute? The most simple, general, and also the most popular answer to this question is consciousness. But consciousness in the strict sense for the consciousness implied in the feeling of self as an individual, in discrimination by the senses, in the perception and even judgment of outward things according to definite sensible signs, cannot be denied to the brutes. Consciousness in the strictest sense is present only in a being to whom his species, his essential nature, is an object of thought. The brute is indeed conscious of himself as an individual, and he has accordingly the feeling of self as the common centre of successive sensations, but not as a species. Hence, he is without that consciousness which in its nature, as in its name, is akin to a science. Where there is this higher consciousness, there is a capability of science. Science is the cognizance of species. In practical life, we have to do with individuals, in science, with species. But only a being to whom his own species, his own nature is an object of thought, can make the essential nature of other things or beings an object of thought. Hence the brute has only a simple, man a twofold life. In the brute, the inner life is one with the outer. Man has both an inner and an outer life. The inner life of man is the life which has relation to his species, to his general, as distinguished from his individual nature. Man thinks, that is, he converses with himself. The brute can exercise no function which has relation to its species without another individual external to itself. But man can perform the functions of thought and speech which strictly imply such a relation, apart from another individual. Man is himself at once I and thou. He can put himself in the place of another, for this reason that to him his species, his essential nature, and not merely his individuality, is an object of thought. Religion, being identical with the distinctive characteristic of man, is then identical with self-consciousness, with the consciousness which man has of his nature. But religion expressed generally is consciousness of the infinite. Thus it is and can be nothing else than the consciousness which man has of his own, not finite and limited, but infinite nature. A really finite being has not even the faintest adumbration, still less consciousness of an infinite being, for the limit of the nature is also the limit of the consciousness. The consciousness of the caterpillar, whose life is confined to a particular species of plant, does not extend itself beyond this narrow domain. It does indeed discriminate between this plant and other plants, but more it knows not. A consciousness so limited, 
but on account of that very limitation so infallible we do not call consciousness but instinct consciousness in the strict or proper sense is identical with the consciousness of the infinite a limited consciousness is no consciousness consciousness is essentially infinite in its nature the consciousness of the infinite is nothing else than the consciousness of the infinity of the consciousness or in the consciousness of the infinite the conscious subject has for his object the infinity of his own nature what then is the nature of man of which he is conscious or what constitutes the specific distinction the proper humanity of man reason will affection to a complete man belongs the power of thought the power of will the power of affection the power of thought is the light of the intellect the power of will is energy of character the power of affection is love reason love force of will are perfections the perfection of the human being nay more they are absolute perfections of being to will to love to think are the highest powers are the absolute nature of man as man and the basis of his existence man exists to think to love to will now that which is the end the ultimate aim is also the true basis and principle of a being but what is the end of reason reason of love love of will freedom of the will we think for the sake of thinking love for the sake of loving will for the sake of willing i e that we may be free true existence is thinking loving willing existence that alone is true perfect divine which exists for its own sake but such is love such is reason such is will the divine trinity in man above the individual man is the unity of reason love will reason will love are not powers which a man possesses for he is nothing without them he is what he is only by them they are the constituent elements of his nature which he neither has nor makes the animating determining governing powers divine absolute powers to which he can oppose no resistance how can the feeling man resist feeling the loving one love the rational one reason who has not experienced the overwhelming power of melody and what else is the power of melody but the power of feeling music is the language of feeling melody is audible feeling feeling communicating itself who has not experienced the power of love or at least heard of it which is the stronger love or the individual man is it man that possesses love or is it not much rather love that possesses man when love impels a man to suffer death even joyfully for the beloved one is this death conquering power his own individual power or is it not rather the power of love and who that ever truly thought has not experienced that quiet subtle power the power of thought when thou sinkest into deep reflection forgetting thyself and what is around thee dost thou govern reason or is it not reason which governs and absorbs thee scientific enthusiasm is it not the most glorious triumph of intellect over thee the desire of knowledge is it not a simply irresistible and all-conquering power and when thou suppressest a passion 
renouncest a habit, in short, achievest a victory over thyself, is this victorious power thy own personal power, or is it not rather the energy of will, the force of morality, which seizes the mastery of thee, and fills thee with indignation against thyself and thy individual weakness? Man is nothing without an object. The great models of humanity, such men as reveal to us what man is capable of, have attested the truth of his own proposition by their lives. They had only one dominant passion, the realization of the aim which was the essential object of their activity. But the object to which a subject essentially necessarily relates is nothing else than this subject's own but objective nature. If it be an object common to several individuals of the same species, but under various conditions, it is still, at least as to the form under which it presents itself to each of them, according to their respective modifications, their own but objective nature. Thus the sun is the common object of the planets, but it is an object to Mercury, to Venus, to Saturn, to Uranus, under other conditions than to the earth. Each planet has its own sun. The sun which lights and warms Uranus has no physical, only an astronomical, scientific existence for the earth. And not only does the sun appear different, but it really is another sun on Uranus than on the earth. The relation of the sun to the earth is therefore at the same time a relation of the earth to itself, or to its own nature, for the measure of the size and of the intensity of light which the sun possesses as the object of the earth is the measure of the distance which determines the peculiar nature of the earth. Hence, each planet has in its sun the mirror of its own nature. In the object which he contemplates, therefore, man becomes acquainted with himself. Consciousness of the objective is the self-consciousness of man. We know the man by the object, by his conception of what is external to himself. In it his nature becomes evident. This object is his manifested nature, his true objective ego. And this is true not merely of spiritual but also of sensuous objects. Even the objects which are the most remote from man because they are objects to him, and to the extent to which they are so, are revelations of human nature. Even the moon, the sun, the stars call to man, gonti seaton. That he sees them, and so sees them, is an evidence of his own nature. The animal is sensible only to the beam which immediately affects life while man perceives the ray to him physically indifferent of the remotest star. Man alone has purely intellectual, disinterested joys and passions. The eye of man alone keeps theoretic festivals. The eye which looks into the starry heavens, which gazes at that light alike useless and harmless, having nothing in common with the earth and its necessities, this eye sees in that light its own nature, its own origin. The eye is heavenly in its nature. Hence man elevates himself above the earth only with the eye. Hence theory begins with the contemplation of the heavens. The first philosophers were astronomers. It is the heavens that admonish man of his destination, and remind him that he is destined not merely to action, but also to contemplation. The absolute to man is his own nature. The power of the object over him is therefore the power of his own nature. Thus the power of the object of feeling is the power of feeling itself. The power of the object of the intellect is the power of the intellect itself. The power of the object of the will is the power of the will itself. The man who is affected by musical sounds is governed by feeling, 
by the feeling, that is, which finds its corresponding element in musical sounds. But it is not melody as such. It is only melody pregnant with the meaning and emotion which has power over feeling. Feeling is only acted on by that which conveys feeling, i.e., by itself, by its nature. Thus also the will, thus, and infinitely more the intellect. Whatever kind of object, therefore, we are at any time conscious of, we are always at the same time conscious of our own nature. We can affirm nothing without affirming ourselves. And since to will, to feel, to think, are perfections, essences, realities, it is impossible that intellect, feeling, and will should feel or perceive themselves as limited finite powers, i.e., as worthless, as nothing. For finiteness and nothingness are identical. Finiteness is only a euphemism for nothingness. Finiteness is the metaphysical, the theoretical, nothingness the pathological, practical expression. What is finite to the understanding is nothing to the heart. But it is impossible that we should be conscious of will, feeling, and intellect as finite powers, because every perfect existence, every original power and essence, is the immediate verification and affirmation of itself. It is impossible to love, will, or think without perceiving these activities to be perfections. Impossible to feel that one is a loving, willing, thinking being without experiencing an infinite joy therein. Consciousness consists in a being becoming objective to itself. Hence it is nothing apart, nothing distinct from the being which is conscious of itself. How could it otherwise become conscious of itself? It is therefore impossible to be conscious of a perfection as an imperfection, impossible to feel feeling limited, to think thought limited. Consciousness is self-verification, self-affirmation, self-love, joy in one's own perfection. Consciousness is the characteristic mark of a perfect nature. It exists only in a self-sufficing, complete being. Even human vanity attests to this truth. A man looks in the glass, he has a complacency in his appearance. This complacency is a necessary involuntary consequence of the completeness, the beauty of his form. A beautiful form is satisfied in itself. It has necessary joy in itself, in self-contemplation. This complacency becomes vanity only when a man piques himself on his form as being his individual form, not when he admires it as a specimen of human beauty in general. It is fitting that he should admire it thus. He can conceive no form more beautiful, more sublime than the human. Assuredly, every being loves itself, its existence, and fitly so. To exist is a good. Quidquid essentia dignum est, scientia dignum est. Everything that exists has value. It is a being of distinction. At least this is true of the species. Hence it asserts, maintains itself. But the highest form of self-assertion, the form which is itself a superiority, a perfection, a bliss, a good, is consciousness. Every limitation of the reason, or in general of the nature of man, rests on a delusion, an error. It is true that the human being as an individual can and must Herein consists his distinction from the brute, feel and recognize himself to be limited. But he can become conscious of his limits, his finiteness, only because the perfection, the infinitude of his species, is perceived by him, whether as an object of feeling, of conscience, or of thinking consciousness. If he makes his own limitations the limitations of the species, 
This arises from the mistake that he identifies himself immediately with the species, a mistake which is intimately connected with the individual's love of ease, sloth, vanity, and egoism. For a limitation which I know to be merely mine humiliates, shames, and perturbs me. Hence, to free myself of this feeling of shame, from this state of dissatisfaction, I convert the limits of my individuality into the limits of human nature in general. What is incomprehensible to me is incomprehensible to others. Why should I trouble myself further? It is no fault of mine. My understanding is not to blame, but the understanding of the race." But it is a ludicrous and even culpable error to define as finite and limited what constitutes the essence of man, the nature of the species, which is the absolute nature of the individual. Every being is sufficient to itself. No being can deny itself, i.e. its own nature. No being is a limited one to itself. Rather, every being is in and by itself infinite, has its God, its highest conceivable being, in itself. Every limit of a being is cognizable only by another being out of and above him. The life of the ephemera is extraordinarily short in comparison with that of longer-lived creatures, but nevertheless for the ephemera this short life is as long as a life of years to others. The leaf on which the caterpillar lives is for it a world, an infinite space. That which makes a being what it is, is its talent, its power, its wealth, its adornment. How can it possibly hold for its existence non-existence, its wealth poverty, its talent incapacity? If the plants had eyes, taste, and judgment, each plant would declare its own flower the most beautiful. For its comprehension, its taste would reach no further than its natural power of production. What the productive power of its nature has brought forth as the highest, that must also its taste, its judgment, recognize and affirm as the highest. What the nature affirms, the understanding, the taste, the judgment cannot deny. Otherwise, the understanding, the judgment, would no longer be the understanding and judgment of this particular being, but of some other. The measure of the nature is also the measure of the understanding. If the nature is limited, so also is the feeling, so also is the understanding. But to a limited being, its limited understanding is not felt to be a limitation. On the contrary, it is perfectly happy and contented with this understanding. It regards it, praises it, values it as a glorious divine power. And the limited understanding on its part values the limited nature whose understanding it is. Each is exactly adapted to the other. How should they be at issue with each other? A being's understanding is its sphere of vision. As far as thou seest, so far extends thy nature, and conversely. The eye of the brute reaches no farther than its needs, and its nature no farther than its needs. And so far as thy nature reaches, so far reaches thy unlimited self-consciousness, so far art thou God. The discrepancy between the understanding and the nature, between the power of conception and the power of production in the human consciousness, on the one hand, is merely of individual significance, and not a universal application. And, on the other hand, it is only apparent. He who having written a bad poem, knows it to be bad, is in his intelligence, and therefore in his nature not so limited as he who, having written a bad poem, admires it and thinks it good. It follows that if thou thinkest the infinite, thou perceivest and affirmest the infinitude of the power of thought. If thou feelest the infinite, 
thou feelest and affirmest the infinitude of the power of feeling. The object of the intellect is intellect objective to itself. The object of feeling is feeling objective to itself. If thou hast no sensibility, no feeling for music, thou perceivest in the finest music nothing more than in the wind that whistles by thy ear, or than in the brook which rushes past thy feet. What then is it which acts on thee when thou art affected by melody? What dost thou perceive in it? What else than the voice of thy own heart? Feeling speaks only to feeling. Feeling is comprehensible only by feeling, that is, by itself, for this reason that the object of feeling is nothing else than feeling. Music is the monologue of emotion. But the dialogue of philosophy also is in truth only a monologue of the intellect. Thought speaks only to thought. The splendors of the crystal charm the sense, but the intellect is interested only in the laws of crystallization. The intellectual only is the object of the intellect. All, therefore, which, in the point of view of metaphysical, transcendental speculation and religion, has the significance only of the secondary, the subjective, the medium, the organ, has in truth the significance of the primary, of the essence, of the object itself. If, for example, feeling is the essential organ of religion, the nature of God is nothing else than an expression of the nature of feeling. The true but latent sense of the phrase, feeling is the organ of the divine, is, feeling is the noblest, the most excellent, i.e. the divine in man. How couldst thou perceive the divine by feeling, if feeling were not itself divine in its nature? The divine assuredly is known only by means of the divine. God is known only by himself. The divine nature, which is discerned by feeling, is in truth nothing else than feeling enraptured, in ecstasy with itself, feeling intoxicated with joy, blissful in its own plenitude. It is already clear from this that where feeling is held to be the organ of the infinite, the subjective essence of religion, the external data of religion, lose their objective value. And thus, since feeling has been held to the cardinal principle in religion, the doctrines of Christianity, formerly so sacred, have lost their importance. If from this point of view some value is still conceded to Christian ideas, it is a value springing entirely from the relation they bear to feeling. If another object would excite the same emotions, it would be just as welcome. But the object of religious feeling is becoming a matter of indifference only because when once feeling has been pronounced to be the subjective essence of religion it in fact is also the objective essence of religion though it may not be declared at least directly to be such i say directly for indirectly this is certainly admitted when it is declared that feeling as such is religious and thus the distinction between specifically religious and irreligious or at least non-religious, feelings is abolished. A necessary consequence of this point of view, in which feeling only is regarded as the organ of the divine. For on what other ground than of its essence, its nature, dost thou hold feeling to be the organ of the infinite, the divine being? And is not the nature of feeling, in general, also the nature of every special feeling? be its object what it may? What, then, makes this feeling religious? A given object? Not at all. For this object is itself a religious one only when it is not an object of the cold understanding or memory, but of feeling. What, then, the nature of feeling, a nature of which every special feeling, without distinction of object, partakes? 
thus feeling is pronounced to be religious simply because it is feeling the ground of its religiousness is its own nature lies in itself but is not feeling thereby declared to be itself the absolute the divine if feeling in itself is good religious i e holy divine has not feeling its god in itself but if notwithstanding thou wilt posit an object of feeling but at the same time seekest to express thy feeling truly without introducing by thy reflection any foreign element what remains to thee but to distinguish between thy individual feeling and the general nature of feeling to separate the universal in feeling from the disturbing adulterating influences with which feeling is bound up in thee under thy individual conditions hence what thou canst alone contemplate declare to be the infinite and define as its essence is merely the nature of feeling thou hast thus no other definition of god than this god is pure unlimited true feeling every other god whom thou supposest is a god thrust upon thy feeling from without feeling is atheistic in the sense of the orthodox belief which attaches religion to an external object it denies an objective god it is itself god in this point of view only the negation of feeling is the negation of god thou art simply too cowardly or too narrow to confess in words what thy feeling tacitly affirms fettered by outward considerations still in bondage to vulgar empiricism incapable of comprehending the spiritual grandeur of feeling thou art terrified before the religious atheism of thy heart by this fear thou destroyest the unity of thy feeling with itself in imagining to thyself an objective being distinct from thy feeling and thus necessarily sinking back into the old questions and doubts is there a god or not questions and doubts which vanish nay are impossible where feeling is defined as the essence of religion feeling is thy own inward power but at the same time a power distinct from thee and independent of thee it is in thee above thee it is itself that which constitutes the objective in thee thy own being which impresses thee as another being in short thy god how wilt thou then distinguish from this objective being within thee another objective being how wilt thou get beyond thy feeling but feeling has here been adduced only as an example it is the same with every other power faculty potentiality reality activity the name is indifferent which is defined as the essential organ of any object whatever is the subjective expression of a nature is simultaneously also its objective expression man cannot get beyond his true nature he may indeed by means of the imagination conceive individuals of another so-called higher kind but he can never get loose from his species his nature the conditions of being the positive final predicates which he gives to these other individuals are always determinations or qualities drawn from his own nature qualities in which he in truth only images and projects himself there may certainly be thinking beings besides men on other planets of our solar system but by the supposition of such beings we do not change our standing point we extend our conceptions quantitatively not qualitatively for surely as on other planets there are the same laws of motion so surely are there the same laws of perception and thought as here in fact we people the other planets not that we may place their different beings from ourselves but more beings of our own or of a similar nature End of section two.